How's that? Can everyone see that? If you could let me know just somehow that you can see this. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Let me take my chat window down so I can see. So uh, today's topic is um, very wide. And so I was really struggling with how to help um, you understand what the Canadian market is like. It is not a very straightforward market when it comes to gems. However, we have got a lot of gems. Um, so this, I'm going to start just by sort of giving you an overview of who I am and why I even have any knowledge in this industry. I've been a gemologist here in Canada for over 30 years. Uh, I am an instructor of gemology as well as appraising. In Canada, I've taught for the Canadian Gemological Association for a number of years, and now I do some part-time teaching with them. And I've had my own business, The Language of Gems, the main part of it being a, an appraiser for the last 22 years. I also started doing a consulting uh, business for new people coming into the industry uh, to help them not only figure out how to uh, do the appraising end, identify the gems, but how to market their business in today's markets. As you can see, I'm also a mom, a grandma, and a great grandma. So that part of my life is also very important to me. And so I always include it in a slide because um, I like people to know that you can uh, create your life and keep um, family as a big part of it. But enough about me. Let's just get started into this. Whoops, where'd you go? Um, the object objective of this talk, from my point of view, was uh, what is the size of Canada? Because I find a lot of people don't understand just how massive Canada is, what gems we can find in Canada, where in Canada you can find the gems, and is there mining of gems in Canada? All of this goes to the size and our climate and geology. Um, as to whether we have major mining. And you may be surprised to find we really don't have a lot of major mining going on, major production of gems, but we're very um, abundant in them. So it's kind of a oxymoron here in, in Canada. So if you see this, you'll see the size of Canada is, um, we are a country in North America, for those who may not know, we I always call us, we're the crown on the United States because we sit on top of them in the geog geography of the world. Um, we have 10 provinces, we have three territories, and we have, are bordered by three oceans. We have the Atlantic on our East Coast, the Pacific on the West Coast, and the um, Arctic Ocean on our, on our northern uh, region. The other interesting thing about Canada is we have a great amount of forest right across Canada. And we are the world's second largest country by total area. We have 2 million lakes. So the largest number of lakes um, of any other country in the world. You can see there our, our population. Um, there's only two areas in our country that are totally land landlocked as far as provinces or territories. And that are that is um, Saskatchewan and Alberta. So when I was looking at how to help people understand what our gems are, I decided to go from East Coast to West Coast <laughs> and just give you a brief view of what gems we find in our country. However, one of the major things to know is that we have some of the oldest rocks in the world. And that has been documented through uh, places like GIA when they were doing studies on uh, diamond and the rocks of the diamond. Um, but what Canada has that's unique is what's called the Canadian Shield. And it goes from um, 
mainly in Ontario, but it does it stemmed up north. And what this does is give us a lot of other minerals that we, we do mine, such as iron and nickel and zinc, uh, gold, lead, uranium. Um, the Sudbury Basin, which we'll sort of delve into a little bit when I get to Ontario, um, is actually one of the largest mining areas in our country, but not for gems. Uh, it is actually an ancient meteorite crater. So at some point, Canada got hit by a meteorite and it created this dip in our country. Um, we find everything from quartz to feldspar to amber, amylite, emerald, sapphire, uh, sphene, nephrite, opal, peridot, all of those are in Canada. So you can see we're, we are a, a gem and mineral rich country. Or are we? <laughs> um, wanted to give you just a really brief look at some of the country. Um, this particular slide is just showing you on the um, your upper left is the Niagara Falls, which is uh, one of the seventh wonders of the world. Um, it is a tourist attraction like no other. It is considered the honeymoon capital of the world. So just an amazing uh, site when you see. The center there is the eastern coast of Canada and just some of the rock formations you would see if you're coming up along the Atlantic uh, Ocean along the side. Um, the top right is our Prairie Province and that particular picture, you are looking at a farm in the distance, um, but that farm could be 10 or 15 miles away from where we are. That is how flat the land is and that is where we get a lot of our agriculture agricultural production. Uh, the bottom left corner is the Rocky Mountains out in uh, Alberta and BC. And of course, the middle section, the Northern Lights that you see anywhere. Sometimes even in Southern Ontario, when I was growing up, we would see them, but mostly we see these in the Northern uh, part of our country. And then just a beautiful shoreline picture. So it's uh, just another one to show you just how beautiful our my country is. So let's start with some of what we can find. Um, in the eastern provinces, what you see on the little map there is in blue, you see Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island, which are considered all one province. I'm not going to touch much on Prince Edward Island because it doesn't have a lot of gems. Um, and then we will go and touch a bit on New Brunswick. The picture you're seeing there is the golden flame agate and it is found in Nova Scotia. It is an unusual agate because of its its patterning and its texture. It is from the area um, called the Bay of Fundy um, which does supply quite a few of the gems in the area and you could say okay but I've never seen it or I've never heard of it. Well the one problem with the golden flame agate is it is part of a rock slide that occurred and all of the agate is at the bottom of the slide, which we don't see unless we have storms come up the Atlantic coast and get rid of some of the top rock. So it's not an ongoing mining process. Um, and of course, being agate, not a huge dollar value. So to try and put into production mining isn't really feasible. So they wait until they see it and then they will mine it. But it is such a beautiful looking agate. Um, and what you can do with it is um, quite, quite extraordinary when you see the cabochon that was cut by uh, Mr. Dunphy. Uh, how this occurs is the quartz crystals, which we really don't see to the, in our naked, you know, with our naked eye. Um, but it forms in the fissures of the basalt that is the natural forming rock in that area. And when this um, quartz and the silica gel of quartz seep into the seam, they actually cool along with mineral inclusion. And in this case, it's mostly oxidized iron. And that's what helps give this such a unique appearance. So maybe not one you've heard of, but one that 
in Canada is known to come out of um, this province and is known in our country. Uh, the mining would be very small, just as I said, when they see it, they will, they will mine it. Another uh, one that's not really seen <laughs> or heard of very much is Canada has pearls. <laughs> and people are always going, really, pearls? Um, not so surprising when we're you know, sort of surrounded by all this water. However, the only place that we have found them is in Digby, Nova Scotia, hence called the Digby Pearl. They're not the most attractive. They are a non-nacreous pearl, but you can still use them in jewelry. And uh, there is a jeweler in Digby, Nova Scotia that has actually done just that. And they come out of scallop uh, rather than oysters. And the scallops, this area of the world is actually um, the scallop cap capital of the world. Now, only one to 5% of scallops will produce a Digby Pearl. And so you can see, again, it's not a very lucrative uh, thing to harvest or mine. It is usually, um, okay, we found one, you know, as we were opening the scallops up, um, but not uh, something that they go out looking for. Uh, the size of these pearls are usually about one to two millimeters. Some may get up as far as high as five to six. So not large pearls at all. If we move into New Brunswick, which was right across the bay, uh, we actually will find some topaz and some fluorite. These are the two main ones. There are other minerals, gems that are found, but these are also not mined. These are a byproduct of mining of tin and iridium that is mined in New Brunswick. So they come across the topaz and the fluorite and they will uh, put it as a side product, but they don't go looking for it. The um, localities don't produce enough gems of this to make it worth mining. The other part of, uh, of mining or any kind of the industry in Canada is to realize the government that we have is we have a federal government which sort of governs all of Canada and then each province and territory has its own government. And so the laws and regulations that you have to agree to or abide by um, are different from locale to locale because within the province, you also have the um, localized governments. And to um, come to an understanding with all of the governments on how to approach mining can also make it a very deterrent way of um, it would have to be very lucrative for someone to go through all the hoops that they would need to. Now someone just going in to find a little bit of gems may be able to get around that but they would still have to have the mining rights for that area when they go looking for, for gems. The biggest thing in Canada is that you don't disturb the landscape or you have a plan to put it back and that goes for any of the mining. locked here. Okay, this, there we go. So you can see here just a, a, a map of New Brunswick. Uh, again, we're still on the East Coast. And the red little stars there are where there are a couple of mines that we have found some topaz and fluorite. Um, but as I said, it's not actively mined for that reason. One of the gems that you may have heard of is the next one. And that's um, the labradorite that is found in Labrador. Um, we have also sapphire has been found in Labrador and Newfoundland. And the interesting thing about labradorite is the folklore that comes with it in Canada. Um, you can see that it's a very interesting colorations. 
and it shows they say that it's captured the northern lights in its um in the body of its so very inter very uh very colorful gem uh only cut in freeform or cabochon styles it cannot it's not usually faceted uh from our location it is a member of the feldspar family and of course is easily identified by its play of color which of course is called labradorescence this is a uh photo of a rough piece of labradorite feldspar um, has beautiful play of color and it it was collected in labrador canada now the interesting thing about labradorite it has been around for a long time but it wasn't until the 1700s that geologists actually identified it and of course its name was given because of where it was found in labrador newfoundland um, and while we still do find labradorite we now know that it's found in Finland, Russia, and Madagascar. So let's go into um, Quebec. We have a variety of gems found in Quebec uh, from diamonds to garnets. Um, we find them in quarries. And again, the only thing that's mined in any production in this province is the diamonds. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I will talk more about Canadian diamonds, of course, uh, as we get up into the Northwest Territories where most of the diamond mines are, productive diamond mines are. Uh, but the diamonds in Quebec are found in the Renard mine. We also have these lovely Dementoy garnets, which are found in Asbestos, Quebec. Um, want to thank Alpine Gems. Um, Brad Wilson has uh, spent most of his time finding, mining, and cutting Canadian gems. So this is a picture of, of some Dementoids from Quebec. The Dementoy garnet is um, the green gemstone of the mineral andradite, which is a member of the garnet group. It is uh, the calcium and iron rich garnet with chromium substituting as the cause of the demantoid green garnet, green color. And we also have some ferric iron in there, which gives it the yellow tinge. You sometimes will hear demantoid garnets being called olivine, which is a misnomer uh, in the industry, or uralian emeralds and that's because dematoids are also found in the Ural Mountains in Russia. Hessonite garnets are also found in this area and you can see some a gorgeous specimen here from the Jeffrey Mine in Quebec. I'm very blessed I actually have some of the dematoid garnets from um, the Jeffrey Mine in a ring that I own. Um, compliments of uh, of some work of Brad Wilson. This is the Renard Diamond Mine in the middle of, pretty much almost in the middle of Quebec. The interesting thing about the mine here is that the Quebec government actually helped with the production of roads and electricity into the mine. They um, they created the infrastructure so the mine could move forward. And that is not something that is done in every instance. So very, um, as you can see, some time of the year covered in snow. <laughs> and like now, and uh, so it does make it easier if you have the infrastructure to get in and out of the mine. Uh, that isn't the case in the Northwest Territories as we'll find out when we get there. Let's go to Ontario. Uh, a lot of the population of Canada live in that sort of low uh, part of Ontario where you see all the different colors. Toronto is the capital of Ontario, Ottawa being the capital of Canada. There you can also see the uh, 
uh, town of Sudbury, which I mentioned earlier, that has the was where the meteorite hit, you know, so many years ago, not in my lifetime or anything like that. Um, and the other interesting spot is Thunder Bay. So you can see where it is. It's a little bit more northern. Um, we're going to be traveling to Northern Bay here for, or sorry, for th to Thunder Bay. We also have a North Bay. Um, to Thunder Bay for the amethyst production. And this is some of the amethyst. Ontario also had a diamond mine. However, that mine has closed. And I, that is where, again, production problems can come into play. There are still diamonds in the diamond mine in Ontario. However, the legal leases, um, the mine itself was on indigenous land, which means it was owned by um, our in native Indian or Eskimo, so indigenous people. And when it came time to renew the lease, they could not come to an agreement and therefore the mine is closed and the owner of the mine at the time was De Beers and they had to put into place their reforestation and re, um, re put the land to the way it was. That is part of the, uh, what is required by our government to even start a diamond mine is you must have a plan in place for when you're finished with the mine. So not like every other place where you can just walk away and leave it. We don't like big holes in our ground. The, these are some of the diamonds that you might have, you might have seen if you'd seen some Victor diamonds. Um, I was very blessed to be able to go up to our cutting factory uh, for the Victor mine and get to hold and see some of the diamonds. They were some of the cleanest diamonds in the world from the ground. So not a lot of inclusions. So it's, it is a shame that we no longer are mining them, but that is government. However, we do have some production of amethyst and I'm sorry, that one picture is quite blurred. I apologize. Um, we have a mine called the Amethyst Mine Pan Panorama. It is, as I said, in Thunder Bay. Um, this area was, the amethyst was first discovered back in the 1940s by not someone looking for gem and minerals, but by the Department of Lands and Forest. And they were actually building an access road to get to one of our lakes. The mine itself produces about 40% usable amethyst by volume. There's also a large digging area in this mine that is open to the public. And usually there's about 20% usable amethyst in that area. Um, but so you can go and try and find your own. And that's kind of a fun touristy thing that they do to help with the cost of, of mining the amethyst because you can't mine all year round. And the reason is the mine is, at, is done on a seasonal basis because it uses, as you can see, water for mining and once the water starts to freeze you can no longer mine and if in our country that means that you usually have stop in october and start up again in may so it's a very short time that they actually can mine but this is just a look at some of the amethyst and what a mine an amethyst mine might looks like up in thunder bay you can see sort of the rock formation in the back of what it looks like through the uh, Canadian Shield. We have uh, some interesting places in Ontario. Um, for Canada, the, the largest gem and mineral show is actually held in Bancroft, which is in um, somewhat northern Ontario. Um, and here you can go to the core and pick your own rocks as well. And, and you might find some interesting gems, um, but it's not mined. It's just local tourist. Um, but people do come from all over Ontario and Northern United States to this rock and gem and mineral show. Uh, it is coming up again this year. So it's kind of nice there for a couple of years, it was closed down. Uh, we find in this area sodalite, apatite, 
coin blend, orthoclase, quartz, beryl, and rose quartz. Any of those gems could be found by any of these people that are out if they know what they're looking for. Uh, what's kind of interesting is the ones that fluoresce. So people will go into the quarry at night with UV lights because you can find a lot of fluorescent rocks in this area. And this area is when they're blasting the roads to make room for our roads, all the extra rock go into the quarry. And so that's where you can also find some of these uh, different gem and minerals. Let's move out of Ontario and let's start going a little further west and we hit Manitoba. Uh, again, you can still see that there's a bit of it's on um, a lake on its northern shore there that's the Hudson Bay. But you can also see there's quite a large lake right in the middle of it and that's Lake Winnipeg. What do we find in this area? Well, we find quartz and garnet being quite common and at one time it was the, um, we also found amber and it was at one point collected in bulk, but they created a hydro dam in the 1960s and they, it sort of got buried in the water. However, we know that amber does float and recently some has resurfaced. And so they're starting to find uh, some of the amber again, and mainly it's resurfacing because of the wave action and, uh, and because it's got a very light specific gravity. One of the other minerals that we find in this area is um, olivine. Um, but again, no major mining that goes on. The Saskatchewan, I said, it's very flat. It's a very prairie, uh, agricultural based. Hmm, but right now we've discovered there are diamonds in Saskatchewan as well. Um, it, they're still looking into it. Uh, the mine may open, may have opened during the end of COVID. I'm not sure. I, sorry, I should have looked that up. Um, it's very close to opening if it hasn't already. Uh, what the production will be, I don't know. That hasn't been published out yet, so we'll have to wait and see what um, the lifetime expectancy of the mine will be. One of the other gems we have is iolite, and um, that we find, but again, it's not mined commercially. Um, there's just too many restrictions in how we get can get our minds to uh, to mine it, it. You would have to find a very large deposit in order to make it financially viable. Alberta has one of the most interesting, I think, um, stories of a gem. And this is amylite. Um, if you haven't heard of it, you will soon. It is being, um, I know it's now, becoming quite popular in Asia from what I'm reading. Um, we also find topaz <clears throat> in Alberta, but <clears throat> excuse me, the main production is amylite. And this is one that is actively mined in Canada. Um, it is a very unique gem as it's a fossil and it is a fossilized Ammonite and ammonite being a sea creature. And we sort of went, whoa, wait a minute, it's a sea creature and it's in the middle of our country that doesn't have any border to an ocean. Well, that just told us that we actually were covered in water at one time in that part of our country. Um, the marine animal, ammonite, lived 71 million years ago. So it's not a recent. Um, a recent discovery of water being there. Um, we don't find amylite in any other country yet. I am sure that there will be some discovery because why wouldn't there? Lots of the world has been covered with water. The iridescent appearance is a result of the alternating layers of the mineral aragonite. 
and the protein from the ammonite shell. And if I say aragonite, that should sort of put a flag in your head because aragonite is one of the minerals that we find pearl. So the iridescence, the reflection um, of the colors, um, the diffraction of it is why we see it in um, our amylite. The excavation of amylite, sorry, my, <clears throat> sorry, is um, they try to keep whole shells intact. So it's the broken pieces and fragments that are used to craft jewelry. Now, the sales really started in the 1960s when they figured out you had to stabilize this. And they stabilize it by putting a top on it. Um, so it actually is sold like a doublet or a triplet because sometimes they have to stabilize the back as well. The um, stabilization could be a quartz crystal, it could be a colorless topaz. Um, it is always another mineral of some sort. Um, it wasn't until 1981 and lots of partitioning on by the uh, president of the company, um, that was mining the amylite, that it became designated as a gemstone by Sibjo. And you can, if you look back, there's an article all about it um, in the Gems and Gemology, uh, spring 2001. So it's kind of an interesting, if you're interested in that, to go and look at that. Let's head into the far western province, British Columbia, we find jade. But not just any jade, we find nephrite. Canada is actually the largest producer of nephrite, um, nephrite jade in the world. Um, all of our jade is nephrite, it is not jadeite. And we have about 50 known occurrences in BC. So that means there's 50 different people mining this product. It's typically found in bedrock deposits and um, they're usually lens shaped and occur near serpentine rock as well. The estimate market for nephrite is about 1200 tons per year and three quarters of that comes from BC. Um, most of the best nephrite is bought by carvers to create you know, wonderful um, high-end carvings and manufacture to make really expensive jewelry or artwork pieces. Uh, Polar jade is trademarked. It's probably one of the best known in the world of the, the BC jade. And the largest discovery was the Polar Pride. It was an 18 ton gem quality boulder. So you can see that we can call it gem quality. Some nephrite may not be gem quality. Um, let's, this is a piece of, you can see nephrite jade. Uh, we this as much as we say that we're the largest producer we still this is not mined year round either so depends on your definition of mining whether you think that this is mined do we have a large production yes we do compared you know to other places in the world but again it's not produced all year round um Nephrite jade actually is the official native stone of China, and they have over 7,000 years of history of nephrite. Uh, you can see when you 
you must know what you're looking for in order to even determine that this had nephrite inside when you look at the outside. Um, so quite an interesting um, stone to mine. Uh, at one time, there was a TV show in Canada called you know, Jade Hunters. And this, what they were showing is, is the people that make their living um, actually mining nephrite jade. Other British Columbia gems, um, we have uh, amber, we have beryl, um, we have peridot, uh, corundum, um, garnet, iolite, opals are also in BC. Uh, quartz, mainly rose and smoky quartz, rhodonite, topaz, zircons. All of these can be found in British Columbia and have been found in British Columbia. But again, it's one of those where somebody will have, have purchased the mineral rights, gone in and found some gems, but it's not enough to create a mine over. It is just enough to be able to take a few rocks out without disturbing the land and take it uh, and put it out on the market. So uh, glad that they do it because it's interesting to find these Canadian gems when I go looking. And, uh, and also it just shows what a diverse country um, and geology Canada has. Let's go up to the Yukon Territory. So we've covered the provinces now. Let's cover the territories. The Yukon Territory, the main uh, gem up there is lazulite or lapis lazuli. Uh, we also find beryl, aqua, emerald. We find some garnet, um, quartz, rhodonite. Like these are all found in this area too because it is just north of BC. We, this is the actual um, gemstone for Yukon. It is its national gemstone. And it's found 32 kilometers south of the Beaufort Sea. Oh, wait a minute. We have an ocean and now we have a sea. Yes, <laughs> we have both. And the color and crystalline qualities of Yukon's lazulite are among the finest in the world. Again, our, our country um, has some beautiful gems. It's just figuring out how to mine them and are there enough to make it productive. The Northwest Territories, let's get into diamonds. Um, Canada is the third largest producer in the world by volume of diamonds as of right now. Even with some of the mines closed, we are still third largest producer in the world. We have some of the cleanest diamonds as far as inclusions go in the world. And I want to talk a bit about a couple of the mines that you may have heard of or not. Um, the Divic mine, uh, interesting, um, for this mine, it is 200 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. It was at the bottom of Lake, or as we call it, Lac de Grasse, which is a lake. So in order to get to our diamonds there, we had to figure out how to dam the lake back so we could do our mining. These, this particular mine comprises right now four diamond bearing pipes that are all being mined, they're open pit and underground. So both methods of mining are used. And the um, in the winter, you can see the difference from summer to winter, all of a sudden you lose the lakes. And that's a good thing because now you have a, the ice road that is created over top of the lakes in order to bring in materials for mining. Um, all supplies come in during a short period of time, or they have to be flown in. If you fly into the Divic mine, you fly over the hole, the crater, the, the mine itself. And so you have to know what you're doing because all your instruments go 
a little wonky because you're flying over this big hole. Um, so all of a sudden the depth perception of the airplane changes. So the pilots have to rely on their knowledge to fly in and out of Divec. This is the Akati diamond mine. And you can see now a picture of the ice road that is used, uh, famous in Canada for um, the transportation and not a job I want to drive across an ice road. I may have it today. We're, they're calling for ice here. But the Akati diamond mine officially began production in 1998. It was the first diamond mine that was open in Canada. And the exploration went back as far as 1981 um, and even further. The, some of the um, uh, information that was read by the geologists that actually discovered the Akati mine were things that were put out by the founder of the Canadian Gemological Association. He believed we had diamonds in the 50s. So uh, when you start looking at that, there have been some knowledge that it's there, it's just where. Uh, the Lac, again, the Akati diamond mine is in the Lac de Gras region as, region as well, which as I said is about 300 kilom 200 kilometers of the south of the Arctic Circle and 300 kilometers northeast of Yellowknife, which is the main, I guess, city <laughs> in that area. Um, production was focused on six open pits to start with, the Panda, the Koala, the Misery, the Fox, the Koala North and Beartooth, and three underground, which was the Panda, the Koala and the Koala North. Current life of the Akati, including the addition of a new open pit, runs to about 2028. So we still have a few years. Um, they're still exploring the area, so they may come up with some more diamond mines that they, you know, diamond, uh, diamond auriferous material. And that could then um, extend the life of this mine even further. This is a picture of the Canadian diamonds. Um, you'll see, as I said, there are some that have closed. Um, Jericho is closed. Ikati is there. Divex there. Snap Lake has closed. Gachaku is um, in production. It's a little bit smaller and a, bit, a little bit newer, so we're still learning more about that. Um, the Renard in Quebec is active. The Victor Mine in, in Ontario is closed. And we have the Star Orion, which, as I said, will be coming online, if not already. The reason I told you why the Victor Mine closed, but some of the reasons the uh, ones up north closed, one is it wasn't viable to mine anymore. And two, they couldn't keep them from flooding. And so they had to close down the mines for safety. Some of the other uh, gems we find in the Northwest Territories are uh, beryl, mainly the colorless. We also have pale green, um, iolite again, garnets, you can find garnets everywhere. They're one of the indicators for diamonds. That's one of the ways we found them. Um, we also have spodumene and tourmaline. And what you can see on the right there is a picture of a tourmaline crystal and some faceted gems. Nunavut, the last territory we're going to talk about. Nunavut also um, includes Baffin Island. So it accounts for roughly 20% of 20% of Canada's land mass. Um, so it's our largest subdivision. We have some diamonds in this area, as we say, um, but they're actually looking right now for gold. They believe that they're going to find a huge gold deposit. And so that would uh, be a different part of the jewelry industry, but still uh, not a gem, but still a mineral that we need. Um, the diamonds in this area have been a little bit smaller than what we find in some of our other mines, uh, but still just as, as attractive. Um, they're not really mining where they're finding the small ones, where they're finding the gold, they're looking for the gold. So when they hit the big gold strike, that's what the diamonds will be a secondary product to the gold. And of course, we always have our friends, the polar bears, who if you're up in the north, northern part of Canada, you have to be aware of. The one thing that the mines um, 
all have to be aware of in our Northwest Territories is the animals have the right of way. Uh, not because they're all dangerous. Yes, I would not want to tackle a polar bear, but because that is what is required in their lease to be mining up there. Um, you see the wild animals, they have the right of way over you. Baffin Island is um, the only, today's, the only, to date, the only significant deposit of sapphires. Um, and they were found near Kinemaru in 2002. They do not have to be heated. They are stunningly beautiful on their own. But again, they're not mined in a huge capacity. But they were so beautiful that uh, 48 of them were, were used in a ceremony, ceremonial brooch that was presented the Queen Elizabeth II um, on her 65th Jubilee because that would be a sapphire. Um, other gems that we find in Baffin Island or on Baffin Island is uh, lapis lazuli and the rare cobalt spinel. So, but again, not in enough to make it production wise. But here's some of the sapphires that have been found in Kinemurit. Um, they can be, the blue is stunning, but they can be colorless and the yellow, golden yellow is also a very attractive sapphire. Um, I hope that your day is full of sparkle uh, and uh, full of gem life. These are some of the uh, places I went to to reference for this uh, talk. I hope you've learned a little bit about Canada and our gems and why we are not able to, um, to actually mine a lot. The only real production we have is in the diamonds, the amylite, and some nephrite. But if you're willing to go out into the middle of nowhere, truck two days by foot, you might just find your own gems. I'll just stop sharing my screen. So I'm back to you guys. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. So now these we can find them anywhere apart from in Canada. Oh, sorry, I'm not I'm not hearing really well when if it might be easier if we just put it in the chat, if someone just types it in the chat for me. I'm getting an echo for some reason on my computer today. So I apologize. No questions? Um, these gems, um, the amylite definitely is one of the ones that's only found to Canada. Um, are these very specific? No. Um, but I mean, um, okay, I'm seeing our, these are typical gems only found in Canada. No, and they're not very specific to Canada. You can find these gems, of course, you know, sapphires and that we find all over. Um, these are just ones that I thought would be of interest to you to show that there's a real diversity in our gems and minerals. Um, mining rate, how to acquire mining rights in Canada. Um, I'm not really well versed in that, but I can tell you what I know. To acquire mining rights in Canada, you have to. Um, sorry. What kind of jewelry is currently trading in Okay. Okay. Maple diamonds are more 
I'm getting conversations, so I'm not sure. Um, to acquire mining rights in Canada is basically you, Are more costly you have to go online with the Canadian government or the, the provincial government the and um, sign up. You have to bid against other people. So you're basically sitting on your computer hoping you get the mineral rights for a specific period of time to go in and mine that kind of um, whatever's in that area. They are not long-term leases. Um, and what they do, um, what you do is not usually enough to disturb the land. So you don't have to have such a huge production with the government. Um, you sort of, once you get your mineral rights, you can usually go in and if, but it's finding them. It's knowing where they are and trying to find them. It's a hit and miss that way. Um, I see what kind of jewelry is currently trending in Canada, in my opinion. Um, we have everything uh, because we have so many nationalities in Canada that they're uh, in my practice. I see almost anything from just um, straight Indian jewelry um, to diamonds to just about anything. So yeah, no real, no real major trend that I can think of here. Um, maple diamonds are more expensive to El Rosa diamonds. Um, not in Canada. It doesn't matter where the diamonds are from in Canada. Yes, some locations now are becoming more uh, aware. Um, at one time when the Acadie mine first opened, Canadian diamonds were 150% premium above any other diamond. That is no longer the case. We are just the same. It is what people want as far as knowing there is a main paper, there is a big paper trail on Canadian diamonds. Um, now, would they buy? So people that aren't aware of gemstones might consider buying gems like amyloid and spectralite. As far as amylite itself in Canada, <laughs> it's, it's become well known, but it actually became more well known in uh, through the shopping network and through cruise lines before it became well known in Canada. Um, before it was accepted in Canada, especially right now. Um, people wouldn't even know what that is. Um, Canada Mark in Diamonds is, is telling you that um, the diamonds are from Canada. So if you come across a, a diamond that's been lasered with any of the Canadian um, companies in numbers and inscriptions, that, is, um, that just tells you they're been mined ethically. Uh, future of the pearl trade in Canada. Mm. There is, it's not a huge pearl trade. <laughs> okay, so what do I think can be done to make people aware of these underpopulated, underpopular stones? Education. Education, not just within the gemology field um, and the jewelry field, but education to the consumer, which is what I try to do um, in my particular business. I am not trying to make gemologists when I teach now from my, my home base. I am just trying to help people understand how to look at gems. What are some of the unusual gems that they can find? Um, I collected the unusual stuff. So I have quite a collection in my, in my home. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, not uh that's that's how i i think people are going to know about the the underpopular as we say right now designers putting the gems into their designs is also another way that we're seeing more and more of those underutilized stones coming out is through designers um the approximate cost of canadian peridot and its specialty i'm not sure what you mean by its specialty 
uh, Canadian pear dough is um, it, no, not a whole lot different in price except for the really um, the really fine quality. Um, the um, again, it's based on quality and not necessarily location. Unless you're someone that's specifically looking to buy, then you have to know who to go to to buy Canadian pear dough. It's not out there promoted as Canadian pear dough unless it's by someone who actually did the mining of it. Um, and for me, the specialty of it is it's Canadian. Um, and the color can be a very intense, beautiful shade of green. So um, from some of them that I've seen in person. I'm hoping I've answered all your, I think I got all those <laughs> questions that were uh, popping up there. If there's any more, glad to answer. And okay, Canadian Peridot and Colombian Peridot. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a difference um, between the Canadian Peridot and the Colombian Peridot. For one thing, Canadian Peridot is not mined specifically, um, it's just been found. And so um, it's just known in, in Canada that there are Peridots there. Okay, so the last question, do I think Indian market and Canadian market could do fruitful business? Yes, if we can get past all of the government regulations between the two countries. I think that's what sometimes holds back is what the government does to us um, in our um, export and imports. But yeah, I don't see why not. I'm not sure, Jaron, what you mean by color barrier. Um, what you're asking in that one, because savorite is a dark green, dematoid is, is a green yellow, yellowy green. Um, my, I like the garnets because of their high luster. So, um, but yeah, they're two different colors. So I'm not sure what that that's coming out. Um, standards in Canada. Um, not sure what you're asking. Sorry, I'm just not sure what you're asking. Any such standards in Canada? Is it on what do we determine color to be? That's a gemological. Um, and of course, the main answer to that is the uh, chemical makeup of the garnet would determine which color it is. Um, specific gems and jewelry demand. I'm not actually in Toronto, so that, that uh, I can't tell you what's in demand there. Um, I only taught there for a week. Uh, I'm about two and a half hours west of Toronto in a much smaller community. Um, I think right now we, we um, yeah, it's, our pearls are on the rise. We, we, I know that they're selling more pearls in, in the jewelry stores. Their uh, diamond sizes are mostly a carat and above now. I don't see hardly anything below a carat for main stones. Um, and we are seeing a lot more in Canada of the un unknown gems being put into designer uh, pieces or uh, into some of our manufacturing. And so that's uh, great, I love it, but as a gemologist and appraiser, it can be difficult sometimes to try and figure out whether it's um, the value um, of it because it could be hard to replace or not. So just an interesting, it's an interesting time to be in the jewelry industry here.
Uh, no, we don't have enough pearls to really encourage cultivation. It is, as I said, more of a byproduct of the scallop, uh, um, which is uh, the scallop hunting, farming, I guess is the right word. Um, yes, the pearls are actually a byproduct of that. Well, I hope you learned a little bit uh, about Canada and uh, how diverse it is, um, how it's not an easy place to come and just go out and find gems. Um, but if you find people that have already done it, you can find some lovely Canadian gems. Um, in my collection, I started um, for ones that are not faceted, I collect uh, micro mounts that are all Canadian. If it's not Canadian, I don't want it in my collection. So sort of a snob that way right now, but it just was a way of, of showing my clients what's available in Canada, what's what we have here. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed um, giving you some information and, and I hope you took something away from today. <laughs>